Good morning, everyone. Sabah al khair to I would like to thank Professor Hisham Awad and Dr. Aya Shabana for inviting me to speak to you on the patient ventilation interactions in volume guarantee. This talk will not be a basic talk on volume guarantee. It will be an advanced talk on the interactions between all ventilatory parameters and the PIP that the patient produce. Here is my hospital, Canada Hospital in Al Ain, UAE. This is probably the eldest hospital in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. That was at a time 60, 60 years ago when there was no roads to Al Ain, there was only tents. And the uh, uh, majority of the sheikhs of uh, Abu Dhabi are born there, like Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, the present president of Abu Dhabi of the Emirates, and also previous president of the Emirates. Uh, Sheikh Khalifa and other sheikhs were born here. So it's very much close to the heart of the rulers of Abu Dhabi. And this is why lately Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed paid hundreds of millions of dollars from his own money to rebuild it. So welcome to this talk. My objectives for today will be to talk a few slides only on the principles of volume guarantee then what are the advantages of volume guarantee? Some questionable presumption that we use when we apply volume guarantee and the bulk of my talk will be on the patient ventilation interaction using volume guarantee. I have no conflict of interest. You see this beautiful boy with all advertisement, but none is on ventilator as you can see. What is volume guarantee? You see here, like always, it's a pressure control mode where the pressure that we subject the, pay, the ventilator or the patient to creates the volume. But now that the volume is created, the expiratory volume of each breath will order the PIP of the next breath. So we have a target volume, the VG, volume guarantee. In some ventilator, we call it volume targeted ventilation. So the target volume we compare the volume expired to the target volume. If the expired volume is equal to the target, then the next pressure will be the same as the previous one. But let's say the volume produced was below the target, then there will be an order going to the PIP of next breast to go up. Still the volume is below target, then the PIP will go up, but it cannot exceed the PIP max. So the PIP max is set three to five above the PIP that we measure on the patient for safety. So when we reach the PIP max, we cannot increase anymore the volume unless, here we see the volume is low, unless the clinician goes and increase the PIP max further. So now, because we allowed more PIP max, the patient had higher pressure, higher volume. It happened that this volume here, the expired volume is above the target. So, uh, the next breath will produce a, a lower PIP and now we got to the target. Something very interesting that I'd like you to notice here, now that we have a volume equal to the target, we normally should produce a pressure identical to the previous pressure. But what happens during the inspiration, the baby at the next breath kept breathing and took 30% above the target. So if during the inspiration there, we don't wait for the expiration. If during the inspiration, the volume taken exceeds by 30%, the volume guarantee, then for safety, the machine will order the breath to stop, the expiratory valve to open, and the pressure will be dumped. You would look at the pressure graph, you wouldn't find it rectangular as it's usually, you will find it triangular. That's a pressure dump. But uh, even if the pressure has been dumped, maybe the baby will still take more. And then at next breath, again, he took more uh, than volume guarantee by 30% and the pressure was dumped and the expiratory valve opened. This is the principle of volume guarantee. It seems to be quite uh, simple. The pressure produce volume and the volume order the pressure of the next breath. However, why do we use the volume expired since the flow meter measures the volume that we take in as much as the volume that we expire out? 
because uh, during the inspiration, there might be leak. We know that the volume expired is at least came from the lung. And if there is leak because the machine compares the inspiratory and expiratory flow and measures the leak, if the machine finds there was leak, it will do what's called leak compensation to compensate for that amount of leak. Because if there is leak, the volume expired will be less. We don't want the machine to give more PIP because the volume is less. The machine will compensate considering that there was some leak. So this is the principle of the volume guarantee. I hope it is understood. How does it help? Only one slide on that. We, we discussed, we, we agreed that we wanted the volume to be always equal to the volume guarantee. The expired volume should be equal to the volume guarantee. We know that C equal delta V by delta P. So VG equals C multiplied by delta P. Since the volume is a constant, and since the compliance multiplied by delta, delta P is equal to that volume, if the compliance increase, if the compliance increase because the volume is a constant, then the pressure will decrease. So this is as easy as that. We keep the volume constant all the time. So when the compliance improves, the pressure will go down. When the compliance deteriorates, the pressure will go up. This way, the patient decides the pressure that he wants. We keep the volume always the same in a safe zone between four and eight mil kg. So we are out of volume trauma. And the patient, as you can see in this picture, will wean himself. You, he starts at 22, 24 of PIP after surfactant and whatever improvement he has, you see him auto weaning till he comes next day at uh, 14, 16, sometime over half an hour, he's at 16 of PIP, and then we're uh, at a time to extubate. So this is the advantage of volume guarantee, prevents volume trauma and allows auto weaning. We also prevent somehow barotrauma by putting a PIP max that the patient cannot exceed. So in summary, how is the volume guarantee? The, we, uh, the patient is allowed to take a volume within 10% of the volume that we requested, the target volume. So as long as uh, VG, as, as long as the VE expiratory volume is between VG plus or minus 10, the PIP of next breath will remain the same. If by chance the volume produced is less than the VG by 10% or more, then the PIP of the next press will keep going up press after press, but it cannot exceed the PIP max. That is the safety. If you want more, you can increase the PIP max. Now, what if the volume is above the volume guarantee? So if the expired volume is more than the volume guarantee by 10%, the PIP will go down. The PIP will go down, but we will never allow the patient to inspire. We're looking now at VI, no more VE. If the inspired volume of any breath exceeds the volume guarantee by 30%, this is a red zone. The patient will dump the breath, expiratory valve will open, and uh, the patient uh, will not have his total breath as safety. Now, I'll give you some questionable uh, uh, issues about the volume guarantee. So questionable presumption. We always say keep the patient between four to six mil kg and don't allow him to go above eight mil kg, probably not below three mil kg. So for uh, preventing volume trauma, four to six mil kg. But look at these four types of lung. On the left up, we have quite a healthy lung. He might take six or seven or eight mil kg easily. That one, we cannot say he should be having four to six mil kg like the previous lung. We have all his left lung taken by the diaphragmatic hernia and his right lung is pushed away. So we have not much of lung to fill. So this patient would be harmed by even four or five mil kg. So the same for RDS of prematurity, you have different level. This RDS of prematurity stage two can take more volume than this RDS prematurity stage three or four, where we see quite a white lung. So it is a wrong presumption to say four mil kg uh, fits all. That's wrong. 
Another uh, point, we say, keep always the PIP max, three to five above the PIP measured. So here is the PIP max. Uh, every time we see that the patient has a PIP max uh, more than five away from the PIP measured, below the PIP measured, then we adapt it. So we keep the PIP max three to five above the PIP measure. But different patients have different compliance. I'll give you here two patients. One of them was a very low compliance of 0.2 mil per centimeter water. Every PIP of one centimeter water will give him 0.2 mil. So while the patient below is a very healthy lung with two mil per centimeter water compli compliance. So if we allow for both of them the same five centimeter above PIP. So five centimeter in this one, as we see here, volume equal compliance multiplied by delta P. So the volume produced will be the compliance, which is 0.2 multiplied by five, that will be one mil. In that patient with poor compliance, the volume produced by five centimeter water is only one mil. In a patient with normal compliance, of two mil per centimeter water, you multiply five by two, five centimeter water will produce 10 mil of volume. So that's from one to 10, it's huge. Certainly the one that is having poor compliance maybe would not like to have more volume than one mil and the one who's having normal compliance will have, would love to have volume, but maybe 10 mil would be excessive. This is why we say for tiny babies, don't allow five, allow three centimeter uh, above the PIP measured. Okay, not to allow too much volume if the compliance improves. The relation between the expired volume and the PIP is like uh, this love story between uh, Sabah, the Lebanese singer, and uh, the and Rishdi Abaza. The PIP orders the expired volume and then the expired volume is compared with the volume guarantee. If it is equal to the volume guarantee, the PIP remains the same. If it is less than the volume guarantee, the next PIP will be increased. If it's higher than the volume guarantee, the next PIP will decrease. So it's a nice, beautiful relation where the, the PIP communicate with the expired volume and the expired volume communicate with the PIP. Beautiful relation, but as the marriage between uh, Sabah and Rushdie Abada stayed, lived only for one day, next day she divorced him. So, so the relation between the PIP and VG, there is so many interactions, there are so many interactions that may affect that beautiful relation. I present it in this heart and they will start to present you one by one from left to right, all the possibilities that could, uh, interfere with the PIP. All of those will interfere with PIP. Let's start by interrupted expiration. We'll see now what means interrupted expiration. You see the patient here is breathing during expiration. There is what's called diaphragmatic break. He just doesn't go smoothly expiring. He interrupt. He doesn't interrupt expiration, but he breaks a little, then he continues expiring. So all of this volume is the expired volume, which will decide the next press. We have no harm. We have enough volume to decide the next press. The, the diaphragmatic break keep increasing and keep increasing. And now, but we still can calculate all that volume to decide the next press, PIP. However, one it goes above the line of zero. We don't call it anymore diaphragmatic break. We call it expiration that's been interrupted. Expiration that's been interrupted. Sorry, it's written here in French because I just finished a talk with uh, Tunisia. I was speaking in French with them. So that's interrupted expiration. When there is interrupted expiration, you see that one expired volume is here. Then there is expired, inspired a little bit, then expired volume here. So the system will think that this is the expired volume. It will not add this and this. And this small expired volume will order the next press and the next press will shoot up. So uh, interrupted expiration can be interpreted as a small expiratory volume and will order an express that's much higher. All right. Again, 
uh, here is a patient of mine, and that picture is quite complex because uh, uh, I see here that uh, there was uh, many aspects that have happened, but among them, there is one interrupted expiration. You see, patient started expiring, then he inspired, and then he expired. That amount of uh, of expired volume will be thought as being the expired volume, total expired volume, and the next breath will shoot up his PIP. At the same time here, we have, uh, as you see, inspired flow and expired flow. The area under the curve of the inspired flow is bigger than the area of expired flow because of a leak, but there's no problem because of leak compensation. As I will demonstrate here also, we see that the inspiratory time is being interrupted here. I'll show the, in the future how, in the few slides, how short inspiratory time can affect the PIP. But for now, let's remember that uh, interrupted uh, expiration uh, could increase the PIP in a false way. We'll go to the leak. How can a leak affect the PIP? As you can see here in this graph, this is a patient who has a leak because uh, you see the inspired volume is the area under the flow. This is the flow, this is the volume. You see the inspiratory, the area under the curve of the inspiratory flow is much bigger than the expiratory flow because there is a leak. What came into the flow meter during inspiration didn't come back due to a very big leak. We can see this leak here. During In the volume graph, we see the leak here. So the inspired volume is this amount. The expired volume measured will be this amount. So uh, the system will think that the expired volume is too little while it leaked around the tube, and then the PIP of next breast will be shooting up. There is in the, all volume guarantee modes in every ventilator what's called leak compensation. So if there are 10, 20, 30%, up to 40, some say 50% leak, there will be compensation for that, and the machine would know that there was a leak. It will adjust to it, and the PIP will not shoot up. But if whenever the volume exceeds 50%, I will take out the volume guarantee because I would think that the leak compensation might not be totally correct. So a heavy leak could increase the PIP. This is the message. Let's progress. That's a very interesting subject. How does the PIP in volume guarantee affect the PIP. Here I'll demonstrate that uh, what's called dual weaning. What's dual weaning? What gives you the expired volume, what gives the volume is not the PIP. What gives the volume is the gradient between the PIP, which is 22, and the PIP, which is six. So delta P gives the volume. 22 minus six is 16. So the delta P of 16 gives you the volume. And uh, you could, if you are an SIPPV without VG, when you have no VG, you could decrease both. If you want the 16, you can have 16 by decreasing the PIP from 22 to 20 and decreasing the PIP from 6 to 4. So 20 minus 4 will be the same 16. So there is a way on SIPPV without VG by decreasing both the PIP and the PIP. We keep the same gradient and we keep the same VE, but that expiratory volume would be produced by less barotrauma and less PIP. That's called dual weaning, weaning the PIP and P by the same time and same value to keep the same gradient and same VE at less PIP. But what happens in, uh, in volume guarantee? Because in volume guarantee, we don't have any say on the PIP. The patient decides his PIP. We decide the VG and the patient decides his PIP. What I suggest you do if the patient has improved, all I ask you to do as in here, I decrease the PIP only because I cannot have any effect on the PIP. I decrease the PIP only from six to four. Then because the PIP was decreased from six to four, the gradient now has increased from 20, from 16 to 18 because this was 22 and this became four. The gradient has increased. That would produce bigger volume and immediately after because it will produce immediately after because it produced that volume that's higher then the volume will be higher than the VG and the PIP will be pushed down. So in summary, in, high, in volume guarantee mode, 
just by weaning the peep from six to four, it will push the pressure down because the gradient goes up and the volume goes up. So by decreasing from six to four, you will see the PIP going down to 18. So you would get nearly the same gradient and same volume at lower PIP. That's called dual weaning. As it's written here, decreasing PIP will increase the delta P to increase the VE, which will cause a spontaneous weaning of the PIP to return the VE down to be equal to the VG. Now, I'll talk to the set trigger and respiratory rate because both work in the same way. If you don't allow your patient to trigger, he will have higher PIP. If you give a respiratory rate that's too high, it will give a higher PIP. I will show why. You see, something I didn't say in the introduction of the volume guarantee, I thought I said that every volume, the volume of each breath will order the pressure of next breath. But that's in fact wrong because the system knows when the patient help the ventilator by breathing in with the ventilator, uh, when the breath is triggered, it will produce more volume and to require less pressure. So normally look at a triggered volume, triggered breath here. Trigger the best, this is the alveolar pressure. The patient took too much negative pressure, so the machine doesn't need to give much pressure. So a triggered breath would need much less PIP. It was demonstrated that a triggered breath need a PIP of two to four centimeter water less than a non-triggered breath. Here is a patient who didn't trigger at all because you sedated him a lot, a lot or you paralyzed him or you put a respiratory rate too high so he didn't have a chance to trigger. So a patient who doesn't trigger, the machine will have to do the whole effort so the machine will have to produce two to four centimeter water more when the breath is not triggered. So for that reason, in uh, the ventilator, they created two programs going on together. A untriggered breast like this one will not order the PIP of next breast. The volume of that breast will order the PIP of the next untriggered breast. So it has to be a breast of the same quality. Untriggered breast order, untriggered breast order, untriggered breast order, untriggered breast, and so on. But this triggered breast, because it doesn't need as much pressure, the program is made in a way that it will wait one, two, three, four, five, six breaths, seven, uh, five breaths, the sixth breath will be triggered. So it will wait till that breath to trigger it. Okay. So in summary, triggered breath need a PIP of two to four less. So what I suggest you do, you put the, uh, some high level of triggering. Uh, so in a way, patient unable to trigger, and then you start decreasing the sensibility of trigger bit by bit. You decrease it, you decrease the button till the patient start trigger. So you don't allow uh, resistance to trigger. You allow very high sensitivity to trigger. You just keep decreasing the trigger sensitivity till at the end, the patient start triggering. Then you say, this is the level at which, at which I will put the patient because this way I know he will trigger the breast and he will has, have less PIP. The same goes for uh, respiratory rate. This is a patient who's put at a respiratory rate of 40 per minute, and that's another patient or the same patient you moved him to a respiratory rate of 60 per minute. If you put the patient at a respiratory rate of 40 per minute, the breasts are so much space between them, so the patient can trigger any time during the yellow area. So you allow him time to trigger and to have less PIP. But if you put the rate at a 60 per minute, the patient has really barely any time to trigger because the breast itself needs nearly one second. So the machine has no time to wait for the patient to trigger. The patient, even if he is awake, and if he, even if he wants to trigger, he will not be able to trigger because you put the rate very high. No space between the two breasts to trigger. So now... What one uh, should do, I suggest that you look at the spontaneous breath at the ventilator breath. The patient should be awake enough to trigger and also the spontaneous breathing should be 10 to 20 per minute above the ventilator breathing. So if the patient is breathing 60 per minute, 
put the ventilator at 50 per minute. If the patient is breathing 50, 55 per minute, go down to 35, 30 per minute. Let the patient breathe less than the ventilator. This way you are 100% sure. Two things. First, he's not hypocapnic because he's breathing. And second, he is triggering, so he need less PIP and he will have less barotrauma. Now I nearly am finishing. Now I reach uh, to the end of this heart. The inspiratory time and the resistance will, will work the same way by increasing the PIP. So if you have a short inspiratory time or a high resistance, your PIP will shoot up. I will demonstrate it in the next two slides. You need, as you know, this is a time constant. Time constant is compliance multiplied by resistance. You need three to five time constant, three, four, five, three to five time constant to fill the lung. Because at three, at one time constant, we fill 63% of the lung. Here we fill a two time constant, 85% of the lung, then 95%, 96, then 95% of the lung, 99% of the lung here. So the point is you need your inspiratory time to be 0 0.3, 0 0.35 second to be in that flat area. And at that flat area, the volume is flat. So increasing the eye time will not make any difference to the VT because we are in the flat zone. But if you shorten the eye time from three constant time to two constant time, look at the amount of volume you lose. You see this amount of volume you lose and this amount of volume in the volume graph you lose. So this volume lost will be replaced by PIP. Since we lost volume, the PIP will shoot up to compensate for that volume. So you would come and think that the patient is not ready for extubation or he's needing too much pressure, while in fact, all he needs is enough eye time. So don't allow that eye time to be shorter than permitted. Let's progress. So I ask all of that question and I often get an, a wrong answer, but I know you're bright and you will answer correctly probably. What would you do? What would you do if you see that your eye time is short as I showed in the previous graph? You see here, this is the flow graph. Normally it should start from zero return to zero. The flow graph here didn't return to zero because the inspiratory time was cut off. The expiratory time returned to zero, so expiratory time was just enough here. So at every breath, we are cutting short the eye time and losing a bit of volume. So if the eye time is short, my question to you, uh, what would you do? So the classic answer, eye time is short, I will increase eye time. That is wrong, because often I will answer this way, I will say, uh, I time is short, is, I think, is increased resistance still proven otherwise? I'll explain to you why. Normally, we need, as I said, three to five time constant to fill the lung. And the time constant is resistance multiplied by compliance. So you need longer I time because three to five time constant. You need longer I time when the compliance improves a lot when the patient gets healthier or when the resistance increases a lot when there is secretions and blocked tube. So if you are now rounding on your patient and you come and see that the inspiratory time is enough, and 10 minutes later you come and you see a graph like this one with a short eye time, no way that the compliance has changed so much and has improved so much over 10 minutes or five minutes. So by definition, a short eye time that was normal before is increased resistance till proven otherwise. So how would you know if this short eye time, I need to increase eye time or I need to section the patient? You go to the volume pressure loop. As I see, there is another talk on the graphs. So they will show you the volume pressure loop. And the volume pressure loop, when you have uh, uh, high resistance, would be square. Because here you, you have to push so much pressure and you gain barely any volume. And then during expiration, the pressure goes down so much and we don't gain any volume. So your graph becomes rectangular. And you see those zigzag in here, which are secretions. So this patient is shouting to me, I have short eye time because I have a high resistance, high resistance causing high time constant. So the good time eye time that you gave me is not enough anymore. Please do suctioning of the ET tube, unblock my ET tube, uh, 
it's not totally blocked because there is flow, but suction my ET tube and then the eye time will be enough without increasing necessarily the eye time. I hope you're not tired now. I'm progressing as you see on the picture of the heart. I'll finish soon. Here is a patient with normal compliance. You see the VP loop is in here. The pressure is on the axis, uh, X axis, and the volume is in the Y axis. Little bit of pressure has pushed the volume quite high very quickly. It's not rectangular. Slightly slower in during expiration, but quite quick. So here it's a good patient without uh, uh, high resistance and uh, the flow goes from zero return to zero because we have enough inspiratory time. So this is the, compared to him, is a patient, I tell you his story. But before telling the story, I'll show his graph. This patient is having a short inspiratory time because it's not reaching zero here on the flow. Um, he has a severely high resistance because the uh, graph is uh, rectangular. Too much pressure without gain of volume during inspiration. Too much pressure going down without losing volume in expiration. So it's a rectangular graph. So normally the graph should be like that. And this will be the inspiratory resistance and this part would be the expiratory resistance. So this patient needs suction. What we see in the FV loop, because of the resistance, little flow, that, that means the flow is in the Y axis, it will go down. The volume is in the X axis, it will go to near zero. So the graph will be squeezed from up, down, from left, right. It will be very tiny graph. So I'll tell you now the story of this patient, very interesting. I, it was in our NICU, they called me from OR saying, we have a seven years old child, we cannot extubate, can you take? I said, what, seven years in the NICU? But yes, I take because they had no choice. We have no PICU, it's a, uh, in our hospital. So we took the patient in an or arrival. He was really deteriorating with saturation going very much down and little bit of bradycardia. So the parents were coming behind him and very anxious and nearly uh, becoming noisy. So I hooked the patient on the ventilator. I got that graph. And uh, so it's a graph of very high resistance. Since he was having some himself bit of uh, cough and wanting the tube out, I just took that tube out and the patient took a deep breath and went all right because that was his graph of high resistance. So the message to you here, Short inspiratory time, TI cool in French means short. Sorry, I forgot to change it to English. So inspiratory time short means high resistance until proven otherwise. So don't increase the inspiratory time, suction the patient, unless you really see uh, a graph like this one, PV graph like this one, where there is no high resistance. So now we spoke about everything. We still have two points to present. How do the efforts of the patient affect the PIP? Here is a patient you see from this graph. This patient is doing no negative pleural pressure at all. He's totally sleepy, not active, probably sedated, whatever it is. The patient is doing no activity at all. The machine is doing the whole effort and the volume is stable all the time. Uh, that is good. Now, what's happening, the patient wakes up and started to do in huge efforts. While he's doing this effort, the machine started to do less pressure because his volume was above the volume guarantee, above the volume, all the time his volume was above the volume guarantee. So the machine was doing less and less and less and less PIP. And at some stage, as I showed you before, uh, because the volume was exceeding 130% of the volume guarantee, the pressure was interrupted and the graph became triangular. It was, there was a dump of pressure. The graph, which was rectangular, became triangular. Till the patient here, in this pl place, he started breathing slightly above the VG, so his graph returned, no more dumping in the, this one, two, three, the last three breaths. He's not triangular anymore because he's not dumping anymore his volume. His, his pressure, but he's going down in pressure still because the volume is higher than the volume guarantee. Till at some stage, the patient uh, uh, took a volume equal to the volume guarantee. But what happens after, 
he decided to take no effort at all. Well, the machine already wasn't giving him any effort because of before. So now the patient is doing no effort and the machine is doing no effort for now and his volume is very much down. So this is a variable effort where the patient initially had no effort, lots of effort, zero effort. So all of these affect the PIP. Another pictures of variable effort straining and so on. This is a patient who was doing initially no effort and everything was done by the machine. And then he started helping the machine and the PIP start going down, 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 down because he was helping the machine and getting more volume than we wanted. So no effort to effort. Then at some stage he decided he will do what's called straining. He pushed like that and not allow any air to come in. If you look at the flow, uh, you will find it zero, like no flow coming. And you look at the volume, it's zero because he's really blocking his chest. Then the machine will start shooting up and up and up and up his pressure while he's training. Till at some stage he says, I'll take a deep breath. And he takes a deep breath and uh, while well, the PIP was already very high and he take a deep breath with it, the volume will go high, very high. <clears throat> so this is a variable effort training and profound breaths. They can affect really the PIP. Last and but not least, that's probably even the most important, is when the physician decides to give the patient a volume guarantee too low. Patient wants a volume of seven, eight mil kg, and the physician had learned from the book, I want to be safe, I want to give four mil kg. But the patient wants seven, eight mil kg. So what will happen, you will see, if the patient wants more than you ask, when you give him, you give him four mil kg, he wants five. So he goes and take five. So initially, here we see that he, the machine was doing all effort and the baby was doing not much. But at some stage he said, no, I want five. So he started he, he start himself doing um, all the effort and bring a volume of five. But because, sorry, the volume here was six mil kg and the baby uh, wants more. So the baby takes more. And then as he takes more, the PIP will go down and down and down and down till the PIP becomes equal to the PIP. So the look, it's here as you're ventilating a patient against a, a ET tube because his PIP is near PIP. So the only treatment for that, give him his six, seven mil kg. Don't give him uh, uh, less than what he wanted. Here is before my conclusion. No, I have probably two more slides. So this is an interesting case I had one day and uh, gave me some, initially I didn't understand it well. That was years ago. I, I was near a patient and the physician, the resident came to me in the morning. He said, doctor, this patient who's having volume guarantee can be extubated because you see how his PIP is very much down. His PIP is six. Wow, PIP is near PIP. It's six, it's time to extubate. But what happened, and his FiO2 wasn't too high. But um, uh, what happened, I looked at his pressure graph, it should be rectangular, triangular. How come? I time is very short here. So uh, I'm not giving a talk on graphics, so I will leave it. But the point is that uh, the patient is breathing at 77 per minute. How come a patient who's ready to extubate is having intercostal, subcostal recession, and he's having a rate of 77? Why didn't he take all his PIP? The point is that the patient is 1.5 kg, and the physician ordered 4 mil kg, which is 6 mil. The patient wanted more than 6 mil. He went and took 9 mil. He's very, he's very weak and quite strong. He took 9 mil, which is more than 130% of what the VG is. So every time during inspiration, the machine would notice this is VTE, but VTI was also high. So during the VTI, at every breath, the breath will be dumped because he's taking 30% more than the VG. So the, the solution for this case is not to extubate, Try to give him his uh, five or six mil kg. If he still want 10 or 11 or 12 mil kg, which they do sometime, and you don't want to give it because it's unsafe, just take the VG out and please put the PIP up to uh, 16 or 14, and he will calm down very quickly. His respiratory rate will go down to 40 and give him time to extubate him. So, in conclusion, 
Volume guarantee is not guaranteed. And you can find that in some ventilator like the SLE, they don't, and also down in McKay, they don't call it volume guarantee. They call it volume targeted ventilation because it's never been guaranteed. Let's show you what are the things that could affect the volume guarantee. One of them is the leak. If you have leak more than 50%, the PIP will shoot up. Second is volume guarantee is too low. Volume guarantee, if it's too low, the baby will take much more volume and either the pressure will go down, down, down to PEEP or you will find yourself uh, with the interrupted breath and the baby will get excited and will breathe fast. So the volume guarantee is not always 4 mil kg or 5 mil kg. It might be increased when, they get, uh, when the baby gets a healthy lung. As I said before, you need to look at the spontaneous frequency versus the ventilator. Here, the ventilator frequency is 50 and the patient frequency is 50. It's not good. If you put a frequency 50 or 60, you don't allow enough time for the patient to trigger. So untriggered breasts need two to four centimeter water more. So you need to allow the patient to trigger. Now, um, what about the inspiratory time? As I showed before, uh, you, if you don't give enough eye time, uh, then the volume will be lost and the pressure will shoot up. The triggering, you don't sedate too much the patient or paralyze him because if the patient is too much sedated, he cannot trigger, as I said, trigger the untriggered breast need more PIP. So another aspect uh, is uh, to set the trigger sensitivity as low as possible. Start from high down till you see the patient taking the breaths. So the color of the graph here will change because the, the breaths are triggered. And then you under you stop there. You say this is the trigger he wants. So allow the patient to trigger by changing the trigger sensitivity. As you see, every single order that you make has an effect on the volume guarantee. It's much less guaranteed than you think, and it's much more complex than anyone would love to believe. Okay, uh, the PEEP itself, as I explained, the dual weaning, if you decrease, if the baby get healthier, I'm not asking to decrease PEEP when it's needed, but if the baby get healthier, by decreasing the PEEP, the gradient between the PIP and PEEP will increase, and then, as the volume goes up, the pressure will go down later. So decreasing the PEEP will force the PIP to go down, as I showed you in one of the slides. And then uh, the PIP max uh, is relevant because uh, if you put it too high compared, that should, that should be in small babies, three above the PIP as here, 22, 25, three above. In turn, baby can be five above. So if you put if, if you uh, put it at 22 equal to the PIP, the patient cannot have more, more pressure if he needs. And if you put it 30 or 35, well, the PIP is 22. If you put very high difference, at any time the nurse suction the patient or the patient strains or the machine doesn't receive any information about the VTE from the machine, the pressure will start shooting up. So always for safety, keep the please the PIP max three to five above the PIP measure. This is the PIP measure. This is the PIP max. And uh, many other aspects, uh, look at the graphs to exclude high resistant. Maybe the patient needs suctioning. If the patient's straining all the time, it's an issue. If he has variable effort, it's an issue. The pressure will go up and down all the time. So this is an important point because um, Volume guarantee should not be put for patients who are chronic because it's only for dynamic patients. As I often say, when you take Muhammad and you give him surfactant, he becomes Ali, totally different patient. So in those patients who are changing so quickly around birth, volume guarantee is very relevant. But in patients who are chronic, you will get all the side effects which you see of the volume guarantee if you put volume guarantee. You know their lung, it's, it's been the same for weeks. It's not going to change quickly. So maybe in those patients at the time where he's totally sleepy and sedated, you check with the volume guarantee what PIP he needs. Then you take out the volume guarantee and you set that PIP. So uh, volume guarantee is not for uh, patients who are uh, too active or uh, too chronic as they should also interrupted inspiration sometime affect the PIP.
I hope this was relatively clear. And with this, I finish that talk to tell you that uh, uh, this relation of love between the PIP and uh, the expiratory volume of volume guarantee, you know, might not stand more than one day as the marriage of Rishdi Abaza and Sabah, because there's so many interference on the way. So please, when we do put a patient on volume guarantee, it's important that we go around on him quite frequently to see if any element of those are affecting him, uh, which I explained, I'm not gonna repeat. Thank you very much.